Do you trade against the trend? Welcome everyone to Traders of the World, our new interview show where we bring inspiring stories about the financial market and incredible guests. I am Matheus Massari and I am extremely excited to be here. With me, I have Flavio Lemos. Good morning, good afternoon or good evening, where you might be around the world. I am Flavio Lemos, president of Brazil, local chapter of the CNT Association, and also author of some investment books. I have just completed 50 years old, a half a center of life, and we are speaking English because we want to show inspire new prayers around the world. I hope you will like it and spread it our world. Great. I'm certain that we'll have an amazing conversation with our guest. Speaking of our guest today, he has a 50-year investment career as a technical analysis, a developer of indicators and trading system. His investing career because began over 50 years ago at a multi-billion dollar patient and profiting sharing money management fund, where he was ultimately tasked with researching strategies to improve the company's investment timing. Disenchantment with the concept available at the time, he began developing his proprietary models that would become the hallmark of his career. Flavio, do you know him for a while, right? His studies and indicators are followed by traders and analysts around the world. Some of his awesome indicators were also included in my last bestseller book. He is the author of some books as New Market Timing Techniques, The New Science of Technical Analysis, and, of course, The Mark on the Trading Option. So let's run against the trend with this trader. He has been called the ultimate indicators and systems guy. Throughout his career, he has focused on defining objective and mechanical approach, and in 2020, the CMT Association officially select him to receive the CMT Annual Award, but only now, in 2023, they were able to host an event worth of this tribute. So please welcome Mr. Tom DeMar. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and I'm uh, looking forward to our conversation. Okay, once again, congratulations, Tom. Thank you so much for being here. Your passion, creativity, curious and fearlessness in time in the market is unparalleled and I cannot think of anyone more deserving the CMT Annual Award. Your knowledge is of immeasurable value to new generations. So please thank your beloved wife Nancy and all your family for being here. Appreciate it. You're very kind. So you have presented your tools of tech analysis around the world, but what was more difficult? Through a ceremonial first pitch ball at the New York, York Max game, or we need a CMT and all award. That's funny you should say that. The uh, the New York New York Mets game uh, was was something that was arranged by the owner of Steve Cohen. Steve and I have been uh, working together for 28 years. I speak to him every day, and uh, I provide uh, special insight to him uh, for for him and his group. Um, regarding the markets. He's very proficient in the indicators I created. And when he bought the Mets, even prior to buying the Mets, he said, I want you to throw the first pitch out. And uh, I couldn't do it the first year. And then obviously um, with COVID, I, 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 I balked, you might say that's a, that's a baseball term. But I said, no, I'll do it the first time I get to New York in uh, 2023. And that's what I did. I arranged it that the, uh, the Mets pitch and uh, Steve was kind enough to uh, to give me the opportunity he also gave me the owner's boxes and he was there as well at the uh, at the game and uh, um, and I was able to have 50 to 75 of my close business uh, associates they were there as well and a number of uh, large uh, fund managers like Leon Cooperman and David Goel and John Burbank and people like that they were there and as well as other people that that uh, uh, media people with whom I've uh, worked with throughout the years, they were there. And then two days later was the MT, MTA annual award. And I was fortunate enough to receive the 50th uh, anniversary, uh, anniversary uh, award. And Steve attended that as well, which is unusual because Steve uh, never misses the close in the stock market. And he did that one time. He said it was the first time in 25 years he missed the closing because the uh, there was a conflict with the uh, the award ceremony and the stock market being open. So it was, it's really a toss up. I, I, 
I had the opportunity to meet all my friends that uh, um, whom I've known for the last five plus decades, and uh, we all uh, socialized together. And then we had the MT annual award, which is special to me because I've dedicated my entire life, both professionally and personally, to uh, to market analysis. And so the combination of two couldn't have been better. And you my deserve family it. there too. I'm sorry. You what? deserve it. All. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I put in a lot of time and uh, effort into this, and we still we still have that same goal to decode the stock market and decode all markets. Uh, we have a staff. My my son runs the uh, the business at the office, and he's got 26, 27 employees, and they're all dedicated to research. And uh, we've created some special research services, which we share with the. Uh, with the world, really, uh, a lot of proprietary, previously proprietary. He has a service called Symbolic, S Y M B O L I K. It's a charting service, but it includes all the indicators of that many of the the uh, uh, most popular indicators I created. So um, we're still making a big effort, and we can look forward to doing that in decades to come. So, Tom, tell us about your beginning as a technical analyst. You found that technical analysis often conjure negative images among the investment community, and you repackaged your work as market timing. So up from the start, you are a lawyer. So how did you discover technical analysis? Well, in the 1960s, uh, after I graduated from, from college, I went to um, law school. And during that summer, I, uh, I, I uh, worked at the uh, in the uh, uh, the, the offices of a, of a major company in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and two of the people there had uh, um, a keen interest in the stock market. One one followed uh, point and figure charts. This is back then, late 1960s. The other one followed bar charts. And Abe Cohen had a point and figure chart book, and Bill Jiler had the uh, the stock market chart book. And they introduced me to it, and I just fell in love. And then, fortunately, um, I did not complete law school. I broke my back. I was in law school, so I migrated over to the MBA program, and I got my master's in business. And from there, uh, I was fortunate enough to to land, you might say, at the fastest growing uh, fund in the country, um, and we managed about three billion dollars, four billion dollars, which was a lot of money back then. And there were only nine of us professionals who did it. Uh, most of the people there were CPAs, lawyers, and uh, and attorneys, and uh, two of the people there also had an interest in technical analysis, but it wasn't well received back then. Uh, our president was the founder, one of the founders of the Chartered Financial Inst Analyst uh, Institute in Charlottesville, Virginia, and he was a, was a pure fundamentalist, but he tolerated the other two and myself, uh, technicians. But the the other the other workers there were pure fundamentalists, so it wasn't well received, and I've described it at the time. I had my chart books. I always hid them in my drawer because it was almost like having a Playboy magazine at a monastery. You know, you just, it was really, it was it was heresy to have a, a chart book because a lot of the uh, investment community didn't believe in it. And back then, in the early, early 1970s, late 1960s, there really wasn't much other than basic technical analysis, and that was primarily moving averages and trend lines and um, some some uh, uh, some some indicators that were overbought, you might say, and oversold, and they they were derived from odd lot short sales and specialist short sales and things like that, statistics like that. So they really was, it was all crude. So I, I took it upon myself to uh, to research as much as I could, and fortunately, because our company was so large, I had a, a large commission budget, and I was able to to dole commission dollars out to uh, the Wall Street firms, and I got introduced to all the technicians, or most all technicians on Wall Street, and then I also had an interest in the retail side of the business, and that's where I met people such as Larry Williams, and you know, uh, this is all pre. Uh, Larry Williams is primarily a, the most dominant uh, individual back then, and he still is. So he and I be began a friendship at that time. So it was, and, and the reason I, I, I refer to our work more as market timing as opposed to technical analysis is because technical analysis that does still has a a, a little bit of a, a bad edge to it. Uh, market timing people seem to accept it better, and our approach to to analyze the market is more less trend following, and it's more more associated with trend exhaustion. 
See, because I was raised in the, in the institutional side of the business, we didn't have the luxury of buying at market lows or after a bottom was formed. And we didn't have the luxury of selling at a market top or just after a top was, was formed because our positions would be too large. So I had to anticipate when a market bottom might occur and when a market top might occur. So all my indicators that I created were developed with that in mind and uh, selling into strength and buying into weakness. And that's, that's all part of this basic concept I've always had. And I, I was able to prove this mathematically. Markets bottom, and people have this notion that markets bottom because there are a lot of smart buyers at the bottom and uh, or there's, there's groups of people that, that work together and operate together to make a market bottom. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. Market bottoms are are formed are, are made because the last buyer, I mean the last seller, I'm sorry, the last seller, figuratively speaking, has sold at that point, and by default, the market goes up with a little bit of buying. And conversely, at market tops, it's not because of smart sellers; it's because the the last buyer, figuratively speaking, is is, is bought, and there's no one else left to buy. You might say, and by default prices come down. So that that's the whole theory of our approach. And that's what we call it market timing, as opposed to technical analysis, even though it is a it's a it's a department of technical analysis. How many indicators and setups you develop? Could you talk about some, some of them? Oh, there have been quite a few. I mean like I said my whole life has been devoted to this seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And then when you have a staff, see I, I was fortunate I had the resources of this big fund and I was able at that time, but see, most of the work I did was all original work and it was using crude tools such as proportional divider, um, a uh, ruler, you might call it a straight edge, things like that. And we, we didn't even have calculators back then. This was pre Bomar calculators, it was pre Texas Instruments. So everything was done manually. And, uh, but we did have resources. We, we, we had an agreement or contract with, uh, with a division or department at Harvard University, but that required that delays in, in getting our analysis, our analytics. Nothing was done quickly back then. There was no, there was, there was first class mail, but it was, there was no overnight delivery. And, uh, so we, we were, uh, we were really determined to do our own research because we had no other option. So we, uh, back then, uh, like I said, I did the, uh, what most people did, I think, who were really interested, and there weren't that many on the institutional side of the business, but I sought out everybody who had any good ideas, original ideas, but I found most of the, the, uh, the creative people were on the uh, retail side of the market, more specifically the commodity side. And that's where I met Larry Williams over five years, five decades ago. And he was the most creative of all. And he and I uh, established a, a very close relationship, and, which still uh, exists through today. And he and I collaborated on a lot of things. And he uh, he guided me back then. And like I said, I, I was fortunate. I had both I had both directions covered, institutional and retail. And that's. Uh, most people were, were solely retail or solely institutional, but I had both because of my interest in research. So how many indicators? I mean, there's in, in, in the toolbox that we have for symbolic, there's probably a hundred. And most of those have been wow. validated. There are quite a few. I mean, it's a, they're not conventional indicators. I mean, they're, and we can get into it. And I have, I, I, I have a couple, a few charts I wanted to show you because because of the success we had with some of these indicators, the uh, they've they've survived. You might say, uh, sequential was created back in the mid '70s. Combo was created just shortly afterwards, and they've survived and they've 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 proven their their um, their effectiveness over all these decades. And there hasn't been much change to them. Now we've enhanced those, both those indicators, but those as far, as far as moving averages and trend lines, we've got those approaches as well, which are conventional, but we, we do everything in a systematic approach. We're totally objective. We don't like the using uh, subjective analysis. When I wrote my first book, I said a chartist, you could break down a, a chartist, the word into a chart artist. And anybody that's an artist is subjective. So I, 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 I identified three, three different 
um, uh, gradations, you might call, or, or levels of analysis for a technician. The first one is look at a chart and, and you conclude if the market's going up or down, and most of it is, I mean, it's totally subjective. One, one day you might look at the mark at a particular chart and you say the market's going up, and, and a month later you look at the same chart and you say it's going down. And a lot of that uh, decision making is, is influenced by, by your, who's ever sitting next to you, people you talk to, uh, the news, news, or, you know, uh, you're, you're affected by all variables stimuli outside the market. The second level of analysis is indicators, and that's where we operate. We operate at an indicator level because we want to make certain that what I conclude today is going to be the same as I conclude looking at the same chart a month, two months, a year from now. And those indicators um, uh, would be the same as uh, if somebody, if two people were using the same indicators, they would pretty, pretty often just uh, arrive at the same decisions. So there'd be consistency. The third level of analysis is systematic approach. You would take the indicators and you would uh, you would uh, improve upon them and you make them a system. And that way there's, there's no interference at all by the, uh, by the trader. It's all done by computer. And that's what we're doing right now. We've been conducting tests for three years with the fellow who is the head of quant analysis at Bank of America and his staff, and they work on staff with us. So, but I mean, we've always operated at an indicator level, and we do have a lot of indicators. And just just about three, four months ago, we created another one, which we thought has, a, or we think has, a lot of uh, potential. But we want to see what happens over the next year to see how effective it, it, it is and continues to be. But we do a lot of testing. We got data way back in time, and we've we. Uh, We've created indicators all the time, so it's it's not something that's static. Okay. I don't know if that answers your question, but there are quite a yeah. few. Symbolics you asked a got hundred. Two questions yeah. in a row. <laughs> that's great. I'm sorry. What? No, you you answer. You have answered two questions in a row because we have. A, I was just so just about to ask you how you develop the the TD sequence and TD combo, and you talk about it. Well, so, I can tell you. I mean, there's 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 times when you know you get an inspiration, like with sequential. I was working with Fibonacci numbers back in in the early 1970s. Uh, uh, this, this this group by the name of Bank Credit Analyst uh, wrote about uh, one of their article. One of their uh, research people uh, discussed the Elliott wave, and nobody knew Elliott, Elliott wave back then. And he said that the Elliott wave operates on this principle which is a, a, it's, uh, dominant in nature, and it's based upon the golden mean and blah, blah, blah. So I, what I did was call the, uh, the, uh, the publisher, a fellow by the name of Tony Beck. He was, he was in the Bahamas, and they had two offices in Toronto. And I contacted him, and I said, can I speak to your research guy? Hamilton Bolton was the name. He said, no, you can't. He died, you know. He said, but I can give you some other person who, uh, who I think – could help you if you're interested in this type of analysis. He said, I'm a fundamentalist, but I could direct you. So he directed me to a, a traveling tax judge in, in uh, Canada. And uh, I called the guy, and the guy's name was Jack Frost, just like the, uh, the, uh, the mythical character that, that, that uh, appears during the, during the uh, fall, winter, and uh, paints the leaves with, with frost. And I said, hey, Jack, I said, uh, um, I'm interested in, in Elliott Wave. Can you help me out and explain it? He said, well, I'm an expert, but I'm a traveling tax judge, and I don't have time for you. So he referred me to two, to two um, uh, physicians down in Florida. And one of them, uh, the fellow by the name of Dr. Wiley, he was in Wildwood, Florida. I contacted him, and I said, do you know anything about uh, Fibonacci and the Elliott Wave? He said, oh, yeah, it's, I live and breathe it. He said, I, I'm more interested in that in my, than in my medical practice. He said, I give you the number series. And he said, uh, I, I, I can, he said, if you want me to, to give a presentation to your group, I'd be happy to come. But the only time he could come would be on a Friday late afternoon, evening. So I went to pick him up at the airport and he wasn't there. I thought, and, I, and all the people, the other eight professionals in my company were waiting on a Friday night and they had canceled their social, social activities to meet this supposed expert because I talked them up and I was walking up and down the concourse at the airport 
and I was worried this guy didn't show, and he was coming in from Eastern Airlines. So I, I called his office, and they were an hour ahead of me, and I was afraid I wouldn't be able to reach anybody, but I did reach his, his nurse or his receptionist in his office. I says, Dr. Wiley isn't here. She says, oh, no, he's there. Don't worry. He'll find you. And then I was walking up and down the concourse at the airport, and some guy with a long white beard came up to me, and he says, you're Tom DeMarc. I said, yeah. And he, he said, you know how I know? And I said, no. He says, you're walking in Fibonacci angles. So I had to bring this person into the office, and it was very embarrassing. I and mean, it really was. The, the guy started talking, and he said, I know Fibonacci and Elliot, and he had data going back to the mid-1800s, and he says, there are different waves in the market. There's 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, you know, 34, 55, 89, 144, 233. I sound like, you know, 377. And he's, and it just, it was embarrassing. So I came back to work the following. I was stuck with this guy for the weekend. And I, and I was uh, went to work on Monday. I thought I'd be fired. And these guys said, we we appreciate your interest in, in um, exploring different uh different new avenues, but make certain you're more circumspect in the future and you don't get lost with these crackpots. And I said, okay. So they, Jack Frost to give me another doctor's name. His name is Ledbetter. He was in uh, Merritt Island, Florida. Uh, Merritt Island, yeah. And I contacted his office and I spoke to his nurse and said, what did you want? And I said, what's it regarding? I said, Elliot, we Fibonacci and Elliot Wave. And she said, uh, let me get him if he's interested. He picked up the phone and he said to me, he said, uh, oh, I, I love Fibonacci. He says, he said, I've been married five times. I have eight kids and every 13 days I take a vacation. So what I found is that there are really goofy people out there, just like I was, that were really interested in the markets and were obsessed with it. But you don't want to get involved with these people because there's no progress, no potential. So, <laughs> excuse me, what I did from then on, I decided I'm going to do my own work. So I studied all about Fibonacci and Elliott Wave and angles. Like the, 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 the angle of the Pyramid of Gizeh is at uh, 61.8%. That's the golden mean. So I, I studied all that, and then I incorporated these into my idea and how the market's top and bottom. And I looked at comparisons of closing price, the current bar versus five bars earlier, three bars earlier, which are Fibonacci. And I finally decided to close current bar versus four ago. And once I've accumulated nine of them, uh, markets seem to react. But I said, this does not reconcile with true Fibonacci because you got nine and four instead of eight and five. But then when I looked at it further, if you take nine and four together, that equals 13. So I did satisfy some of the requirements on Fibonacci, but and then once I've recorded those nines, and I'll show you with the chart, uh, it evolves into further trend movement in the direction, oftentimes, and that's when you incorporate a comparison of 13s. So how I did that. Larry Williams was involved. And Larry was active, and uh, uh, after I've created sequential, we 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 were both uh, uh, researching it. Um, I, I move forward with something called combo, and combo is more exact. And that really is a derivation there, uh, was inspired by sequential. But we got a number of different versions of it, and that's how we that's how I created it. It was more hit or miss. I mean, nowadays you can do a lot things a lot faster than I could. Everything I did back then was with a uh, magnifying glass and subscribing to all the charting services and and having access to things that. Uh, that most people didn't have, but uh, so I was able to create those, and those are really the the two key uh, indicators. And uh, excuse me, um, I was surprised to learn, and that's how we got these charts to show you. Uh, these are actual nines and thirteens, we call them, on uh, Bitcoin. Back uh, back in 2008, nine, and ten, uh, uh, Steve Cohen. Uh, whom I had worked with for so long, had wanted to buy this into the company a number of times, and uh, we just never came to terms. Another individual by the name of John Burbank from Passport Capital was managing four or five billion dollars, and he had a very successful two-year period in 2008, 2009. He approached me and wanted to buy, and uh, so both of them bought into the company. And John was uh, brought to our attention in about 2017. He said, you know, you might want to look at crypto, cryptocurrencies, and we didn't have data. So we just kind of dismissed it. 
But instead, we went ahead. Uh, he, he kept encouraging us. We got the data, and we looked at the data, and we could not believe that 13s and 9s were appearing on the day of the exact high top and bottom of the market. And we'll show you that. And I think in the last five, six years, uh, it's become widely used by Bitcoin and crypto traders. If you go on the internet and just type in DeMarc and crypto or DeMarc and Bitcoin, you'll see that uh, a lot of people are following the 9s and 13s just because of the success we had. We were, we were surprised how well that market, uh, our indicators adapted to the uh, the exact highs and lows of that market. And we, we believe because there's really no fundamental source of information for cryptocurrencies, the only way to really identify tops and bottoms is through something like this, which is market timing, you know, our approach to market timing. So I think I digressed a little, but that's how these different indicators have evolved and that's how they be, they become widely used in the, in the marketplace. So you found that many of the traditional technical tools didn't always work as well as some simple adaptations would. Do you, use, do you still use the classic forms of technical analysis such as chart patterns and trend lines? How do you trace a trend line, for example? Well, you know, the thing is people use trend lines, but that's always been frustrating for me because uh, they draw trend lines. I think it's just human nature. If you have a chart in front of you, you'll draw a trend line. Just you'll select the point way on the left hand side of the chart and connect it with a fairly recent point and say, OK, here's my trend line. And if it doesn't work, the breakout or whatever, you, you adjust it. It's so subjective. So what I did with trend lines, for example, everything I did is it's been systematic and objective. I take the most current high, for example, for a downtrend line, and I make certain the day before or the bar before and the bar after is lower than that high. And then what we've got is called the TD point. I mean, uh, that was just labeled by one of the people who work with me. That's one of our points. Obviously, two points make a line. So we, we take that high and then we go back in time to the most immediately, most current prior high that surrounded the bar before and bar after by a, a similar point. And you connect those two two points to make your uh, trend line. I always tell people trend lines are drawn from left to right, but technically, if you want to call it technically in the sense with the uh, uh, scientifically, you, you would take, uh, you would draw the most recent point and connect it to the next most recent point. And that way your trend line is durable. It's it's long lasting. It never changes. And, and you'll, you'll have the same trend line regardless. Today, yesterday, you know, the same trend line that other people are using, and it's not subjective. And if you want to have longer term trend lines, instead of having a, a, a TD point or a point surrounded Davies bar before and bar after by one lower high, you make two or three or four lower highs before and after. That way it'll give you a longer term trend line. And one thing we found, if you draw a trend line properly, once you break out the trend line to the upside, for example, you can go to the lowest price beneath the trend line, take that lowest price as your reference, and then go immediately above it to the trend line. And because of the dynamics of the symmetry in, in market and human behavior, that distance there you could add to the breakout of the trend line to the upside. And that'll give you a price objective. So all of our analysis with trend lines is based upon breakouts and price objectives. But one other thing that's really important, and it's important whether you use moving averages, whether you use trend lines, whether, whatever you use, is that it's really important to have, once you suspect that the market's gonna make a breakout, you, you, what we found is that if the market is records an up close, the bar before an upside breakout, most of the people who are gonna buy are already in the market. But if you have a down close, before an upside breakout of a trend line or moving average, because people were most recently sellers, they're skeptical. So that's why if you look sometimes, before you break break out above an important level, to retracement level, moving average level, uh, you know, the trend line level, if the bar before the upside breakout is a down close, the price bar, the breakout usually is suspect, they're suspicious to most traders and they're skeptical. And as a result, the market on the breakout is usually on low volume. And then if you close above that breakout price, 
we have what we call the qualified break, but we wait for confirmation. And the confirmation of the breakout requires the next price bar to open higher and then close higher for the day, in this case for the daily chart, and also make a high above prior three bars highs. If that happens, you've got a legitimate breakout. So we've quantified everything. Instead of guessing, we make everything concrete and uh, we make it uh, something that we can you know, always refer to in the future. So maybe I got too long-winded there and I covered oh, no. breakouts. It's, That's it's, great. So you can continue that because I, I'm, I will ask about it. You are known as a counter trend trader. So could you explain to oh. how to create a rose-baited counter trend investment strategy? Totally counter trend. Everything's counter trends. Just like if you were to go to Las Vegas, for example, the uh, the uh, the dealer is the works for the bank. They call it for the uh, for the house, and they're doing the opposite of what the uh, what everyone else is doing. That's the way I operate in the market. And the reason for that is the way I was groomed, the way I was brought up in the business, and I was always conscious and cognizant of purchasing large positions, and you had to buy into weakness. And what happens if you're buying into weakness, you can buy as much as you want. Whereas if you make a market bottom and the market starts rallying, there's price gaps, you know, on the upside, there's a lot of uh, a lot of competition to buy, and you can never buy size. So everything I do is contra. Yes, just and, and you can. But geez, a lot of times, if you go back to the, refer to the moving average breakout or the the trend line breakout or whatever retracement breakout, if you're day before an upside breakout, if you're on a daily chart, is an up close, and the next day you break out, more than more likely than not, it's going to fail. But if you have a down close the day before, it probably will be a legitimate qualified break, and you wait for the following price bar to confirm it. So you could, you really could use a trend line instead of being moving with the market's trend to the upside. If it's not qualified, day before, the, the bar before is an up close, and then you get the breakout. You could almost sell that breakout point because it should fail. So I, I, that that's the approach. Everything we use is against the trend. Even trend lines, moving average breaks, we operate against it. We look for the ones that are disqualified breaks, and we operate against it. Little little uh, too complicated or no? No, no. Can the use of the of market timing and yes macro investing you think so what's that what did you say uh market timing yes macro investing you mean i mean macro timing uh market timing could you could be a better fundamental fundamentalist trader or well, as far as fun with the fundamentals obviously fundamentals determine the long-term trend of any any market so fundamentals are important but Fundamentals will tell you what to do, you know, what to buy, what to sell, but technical analysis or market timing tells you when to do it. So I, I took the chartered financial analysts. There were back in the early 1970s, you didn't have to take any exams, but they started with three exams. I took the exam one, fundamentals, and number two, but I never took the third exam because I'm not. Uh, I didn't consider myself a fundamentalist. I consider myself a hybrid. I'll look at long-term movements and fundamentals, use a good research research uh, uh, source, and uh, I'll, I'll time it with my with the indicators I created. So it's I, it's, I think you got to use a combination of both. Nice. And Tom, do you think it's important to have discipline and use plan to risk the, to control risk? How do you manage risk? Well, here's the thing. My biggest flaw career is uh, money management because I got this perception everything I created is going to be 100%. <laughs> and my whole goal has always been research. And if I can, if I could develop something that's that's had high, you know, sharp ratio, high accuracy, I, I'm content. But I want to improve upon it. But in order for me to get really involved, and I almost had to have a, uh, you know, I think Larry, Larry's son. Larry Williams' son, who is the Jason, who's a who's a psychiatrist, will probably, you know, describe me better. Um, my goals are different. I mean, uh, I have been successful financially. Um, I'm at the point where I mean, I 
I can retire anytime we want. And it's, but I just have such a passion for the markets. I, my goal is more creating creating timing systems or timing indicators. And as a result, I'll go into a position 100%. And I'll hope, which is terrible to say, I'll hope that I have problems with the position because that will encourage me to improve upon the indicators I create. So uh, my goal hasn't been to make money. I, I have been successful in trading, but there's also other problems. The conflict of interest, if you're advising people, it's not worth the it's not worth the uh, the risk. I mean, I back in 1977, 78, 79, um, I was uh, um, consulting with most of the, the major people in the industry, and uh, and I had a reputation for identifying buyouts, for example. And there are a number I could go through. There were 32 stock stock uh, companies that were bought out, and uh, uh, the Wall Street Journal described me as the uh, the Grim Reaper because I would have, uh, uh, we were managing quite a bit of money and I would notify different companies that you're gonna be bought out. I'd say to their treasurer or president, and I, that was somewhat well known in the industry. And they say, there's no way. I mean, when one company was Bud, Bud Company, B-U-D-D, they uh, manufactured uh, uh, cars for railroad. And I contacted them and we were managing their portfolio. And we said, you've seen that we've had a number of buyouts in your portfolio. They said, uh, looks like you're going to be bought out. And they said, no, no way. We know where all of our stock is in the United States. Well, they were born, they were bought by a foreign company. So they were surprised, you know, it was correct. Another company, which was local at the time, was, uh, was eaten, uh, was, was, uh, 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 was Erie and another company, two companies, and, uh, uh, Color Hammer was the name of the company. Uh, they, they, they uh, we had the board of directors of the company in our office, and we told them, "Looks like your company's going to be bought out." And they said to me, "No, uh, no, we we keep good control on who buys our stock." And the only person that was silent at the time was the treasurer. Well, about two months later, they were bought out by Eaton Corp, and the treasurer of the company became the president of, the, of that division. So it. it, it I was never ever, you know, even though I had a reputation for identifying bios, I was never investigated. I know one other instance, Dean Winter, um, I got to be very close to the people at Dean Winter Brokerage House. I notified the fellow who was president, Stretch Gardner. I told him about it. Looked like Dean Winter's gonna be bought out. And he said, no, we don't see anything like that. And they were bought out, Morgan Stanley. And uh, so uh, you can use the data from the, from um, just from the Wall Street Journal. I was using open, high, low, close, and volume, and I was able to determine, and we, we did a lot of a lot of uh, calculations, and we were able to determine when a stock was selling off and was still, still being bought. And, you know, it was a theory, a der, a derivation of something Larry Williams did with, with using the opening price as your focus, not the prior day's close. See, I, I think one of the big... Um, uh, hoaxes that was perpetrated by, by the uh, the investment community, and I think it still still should be corrected. I think you can adjust it on some some uh, quote monitoring machines, but just just to use logic on this, if uh, IBM, for example, yesterday closed at 150, and they announced after the close they announced record earnings or some big announcement, and the stock went up 10 points. Then it closed at 150. It opened the next day at 160. But it were to close that day at 154, it'd still be up four points for the day versus yesterday's close. But it's down six points from the opening. So the reference point really should be the current day's open. And that applies to all markets. I mean, usually earnings are announced after the close or before the opening. So that impact is, is determined by the opening price. So the movement should really be from yesterday's, not from yesterday's close to today's close. It should be from today's open to today's close. So if you were to accumulate all those days that the market closed above its open or below its open, and there are other calculations involved. You take the, you know, you take the range for the day and you allocate how much was buying pressure or whatever. Uh, you can come up with some good results. I mean, there's really no time for us to do it nowadays, and there haven't been very many buyouts, but it's, it was really helpful. We found that markets uh, 
when, when that, that's how we came to the conclusion that markets bottom not because of smart buyers when buy, people are buying at a market bottom it's usually short covering and when people are not buying at a bottom that's usually when the market's bottom because two people are too many people are afraid i think if you go we've had a number of interviews and we had an interview at the march low in 2020 the day of the low and we said buy and the reason for that is because everybody was concerned you know same thing happened in 1987 i mean all these different turning points in the market especially at lows is when the market is exhausted the selling's exhausted so um but as far as what, what do i trade do i have money i don't want conflicts i i don't profess to be the greatest money manager but someone like steve cohen is and i've got money with steve cohen so i don't need to do it i, I supply input with my research but I, I don't care to manage money there's a statement that says millionaires don't use astrology billionaires do and yep. it's good to jp morgan so you work as a special market time advisor to the billionaire steve cohen a holder you have held for more than 20 years is it true that you have a special phone like commissioner board aligned to batman that can uh catch you anytime so do you know if he are in his plans to buy a Brazilian soccer team? There's one called Vasco da Gama with more than 100 years of history and has amazing 30 million fans like me. Okay, just kidding. So how does it work with a guy like Bruce Wayne? I mean, I've been fortunate. And back in the in the 70s, I advised, uh, there was only one hedge fund back then. It was Steinhardt. It was Steinhardt fired in Berkowitz back then. Mike Steinhardt was an excellent trader. I worked with a guy named George Henry. He was in charge of bonds there. Worked closely with him. I worked with Paul Tudor Jones. I was executive vice president with Peter Borsch at the company there. Uh, Leon Cooperman and I have been friends for 45 years, 50 years. Um, you know, Paul Jones. And, and then in 1979, 80, 82, uh, Soros with, the, uh, with his quantum fund. But I worked with people who worked with him. I, I've seen them all, all the traders. But... No one is like Steve Cohen. No one. I mean, he's he's special, and uh, you know he, he's able to to, to ferret, uh, you know, to to determine which indicators are valuable and when. And he's also got such experience and the sense for the market that uh, it, it can't be quantified. I mean, everybody said, and I tell people this all the time, that uh, you know Michael Michael Jordan, the basketball player, could never teach somebody how to jump, how to dunk. You have to have the ability and like steve i mean steve can't teach what he has i mean when i was with paul jones i know this is 40 years ago no not, not quite 35 years ago um artificial intelligence was 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 a subject that peter borsch talked about a lot and what happened they, they uh they had a group come in and they, they they claimed that they could mimic or they could clone paul tudor jones and i happened to be sitting there at the time excuse me and they asked paul why did you take this buy why did you buy at the market by this particular position i thought it was cotton sugar i don't know what it was at the time gold and he said because of this this and this and he gave reasons why why he bought and then and you know, i would occasionally go to new york i was living i was living in living in north carolina at the time and uh, i'd go back and they were still there quizzing paul on why he's doing this and why he's doing that and the next time I was there, he said, to Paul, why are you buying here? And he, they, he said, because of this, this, and this. And they said, well, this contradicts what you said previously. It's, it's just the opposite. He said, well, that's the way I feel right now. So he really can't, he couldn't describe, I mean, for a computer, for, for a computer programmer, the specific reason why he's doing it. And that's the same way with Michael Jordan and the same way with, with, uh, with Steve Cohen. I mean, when I talk to Steve every every day, he, he he supplies me with fundamental justification or input why the market's going to do this or this and this. And he's he's got total control or he's got total understanding of uh, of uh, my indicators. And he's also got other indicators, and he just uh, he's a computer himself. He's the best. He's the best. I think Larry Williams would tell you the same thing. But I've known him all. There's a fellow named Charlie. D. Francesca, who was the biggest trader on the uh, on the Chicago Board of Trade in the bond pit, uh, 
he was the same way. I, Charlie and I were the closest friends. I was leaving Cooter to join him. We were going to have a fun. And uh, it was, it was, a, he, Charlie was trading a uh, hundred thousand bonds a day for his personal account. And I would say to Charlie, Charlie would say to me, Tom, he says, I, I know when to buy and sell, but I, I couldn't do it for a living off the floor of the exchange. He says, I can feel things down here. He said, I can't tell you why I'm doing it. It's almost inspirational. It's part of my nature. And that's the way I describe it. And I found that most of the people who are excellent traders really don't have any emotions. <laughs> I, I get very emotional. They don't get emotional. They really don't. I mean, I mean, there could be a car crash in front of them and they'll just shrug their shoulders as long as, does anybody get hurt? No, no, that's a big deal. But I mean, they don't seem to care about they're not influenced at all. And I think if you put a, a measuring something, if you were to measure their, their, uh, the brain waves when, when something goes wrong, they, they just accept it. They adapt. If you want to use that word, they can adapt. You know, Larry Williams son, Jason could probably explain why, but it, it's just some people are, are born that way and, uh, uh, adapt. They can accommodate and, and adjust for, to, uh, the different uh, ton expected events, and that's the way Steve is. I got nothing but re respect for him. I mean, he, he he apparently had some some issues. At least people claimed he did, but I I saw him. I spoke to him every day. Nothing like that ever happened. And uh, he's he's a survivor. And all these he's people are survivors. He is. he is. He's the best. One of the best traders ever. Oh, he is. He is. He is definitely, definitely. He is the best. He is, I've seen them all. I really have. I mean, some of them, some of them got reputations that are unjustified. They're great and this and that. I mean, they have one or two good trades. But he, he survives. That's the thing. He, he was, uh, it, it, it's, it's amazing what he does. I mean, he could, he could tell me, I said, well, look, we got this, this and this happening right now. You ought to consider it. And he'll tell me, he said, well, this time it shouldn't work. Well, I thought Paul Jones used to do that to me. He followed, I remember we had sequential in 1987, for example. I remember uh, there was a trade at one well, of the top of the market. If you go, if you take our sequential, just the basic sequential and combo, and you apply it to the Dow Jones average, and you'll see that the uh, the peak, August 26, 24, 26, 26 the, that, that particular peak, there was a 13, okay? And then if you use Fibonacci, 55 trading days later was the October 3rd low. So you, you, you weave together Fibonacci 55, you could take the nine and 13s that we developed, you could take combo, you can get the August peak. The same thing happened in, the, in the, what? <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it happens over and over again. You'll get 13s and you, you can apply other other um, techniques to it too, but I know what Paul said we we had a, a you know a, a a sell signal on soybeans and oh no we had it on a number of currencies, and he said uh, how do you determine this is when we first got into this and the understanding of the indicators he said I want to know what happens when it doesn't work so that's his mentality he he, he doesn't assume everything's going to work he says what happens when it doesn't work and I said well. You have uh, stop losses. You, you can call them risk levels, as we call them. And it, once they're exceeded, he said, "What happens then?" I said, "They accelerate in the other du other direction." So, and, and that's something you know some of your listeners could do as well. If you take a high on a chart, for example, and uh, and you take a high that's that's been a high for maybe just to round it off, eighty nine trading days, it, the market had not gone higher. And 89 days prior, had never gone higher, just to take a Fibonacci number. If you take the range that day, the price range from the high to the low, and if there's a gap, you take the prior days close, and you add that high to that high, and once you close above there, and it's preceded by a down close the day before, you probably are breaking out in the other direction. And so whatever you sold, that's where you're, I mean, you could do this with a five-day high, an eight-day high, or whatever. Well, Paul said, well, what happens if you break this uh, this risk level? And, he, and we looked at it, and the market accelerates the other way. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he said, I'd rather take the trades 
that don't work because they move quicker and uh, it's against the trend. So that's that's his way of you know trading. That was his way of trading. I think he's he's a longer term trader now, but uh, you know Steve's familiar with all that too. It's just when you get to the point you're managing a billion dollars, two billion, five billion dollars, you, you don't have the flexibility. I mean, it's, a lot of these guys like to trade, but they're too big to trade, and they can only do it a small portion of the their funds. Now Steve Steve's capable of trading. He concentrates on the on the big names stocks or markets and he's able to trade those and successfully you said in your award speech that when someone has a passion for something it is something special and you want to do it regardless what you are paid so Tom please what's your final advice would you give to younger trades okay I, I think one thing people alluded to they asked me in my first book what I wrote uh, Larry Bird was a uh, uh, famous college basketball player in, in Indiana State, and then he went on to Boston Celtics, and he was he's a legend, uh, Larry Bird is. But when he was 1979, he was interviewed after he was drafted by a professional team. And he said, and I always, <laughs> I always look back at this and laugh, he said after he had signed his contract and everything, he said, uh, to the reporter. He said, how do you feel? He said, I feel great. He said, this has been my goal all my life. And he said, what do you have to say to your, to your followers, to the owners? And he said, I can tell you something now that I've signed my agreement. He said, I love this game so much. I would play for nothing. <laughs> he said, he said, I, I, I'm so, so obsessed with this. And that's the way I feel with the markets. I mean, I'd be doing this regardless. I mean, if, this is a vocation avocation for me. It's my hobby. It's my life. I mean, it's turned out to be my life. What, I, what I've told people, and I've gotten in trouble because I, I, I guess I'm notorious for for speaking without a filter. I, I was giving a speech in California. This is more on the retail side. And I told people at, at a big conference, there are 6,000 people in the audience, and they were asking questions, and I'll take any question and I'll answer it. And someone said there was we were in an auditorium and next door was where all the booths were for the uh, for the uh, different services, the vendors. They were selling things. And they said they said to me, uh, the one the one person said, what's your best advice you can give to all the people here? And I said, avoid the <laughs> avoid the, the room next to us because you're going to be sold things that are useless. And I got in trouble for saying it, which is truth, though. I mean, you you got to find what you're most passionate about, and you got to be committed to it. And you can't be you can't be uh, inspired by making lots of money. If, if you, if, if, I think anybody you know who's really into something and is, is, is an expert at it, the money comes afterwards. So you, you can't go into a profession looking to make money. You want to go into a profession because you really love it and. It's something that will fulfill your life. And that's what's happened for me. And I've been fortunate. I mean, nobody's had the opportunities I've had. I was in the institutional side of the market when it was growing. I've had relationships on the retail side of the market. And most people are compartmentalized. They, they're solely institutional or solely retail. I've also focused on stocks and I focused on commodities, you know, futures, I was one of the first people. I, I bought a, an exchange on the Chicago Board of Options Exchange. Seats were for ten thousand dollars back in 1972, and they started trading in 1973. I bought two seats or three seats, but when my my uh, my company found out, they said, "Oh no, no, you can't do that. You got to turn them back. It's too speculative to buy options." So I never executed it. But that's something that I, you know, I was always interested in something related to what I was doing to expand my uh, my knowledge. And that's what I did. So uh, giving advice to people, I'll tell you, it's difficult. I think Rod and Chris, who are listening right now, they'll tell you the same thing. People ask me, you know, they want to be, they want to trade markets. And they said, what advice can you give us? And I, I tell them, if you got a full-time job, I said, you got two options, either be a long-term investor using technical analysis or market timing, I would suggest, or take up another hobby, stamp collecting or 
model trains or something like that, you're going to end up losing. Unless you're full time, unless you're full time, you're. I've seen the people you're competing with, and these people are geniuses, and they've got resources the average investor doesn't have. So it, I think it's it's like trying to win the lottery. If you're not prepared and you just throw money at the market, you might get lucky, but it's it's not a long term successful path. Nice. What a great advice. And we come to an end of this astonishing interview with Mr. Thomas DeMarc. We want to thank you all, our viewers, for joining us on this journey. And you also want to thank you, Tom, and of course your wife, Nancy, for sharing your great histories and remarkable achievements with us. We hope that your accomplishments and dedication inspire trainers around the world. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Remarkable. Thank you very much. Bye.